Welcome to Transformers, the podcast about how business people and policymakers are creating a sustainable future. I'm your host, Kai Embren. My guest today is Stuart Hart. He's one of the world's top authorities on the implication of environment and poverty for business strategy. According to Blomberg's Business Week, he's one of the founding fathers of the base of the pyramid economic theory. With Professor Prahala, he wrote the path-breaking 2002 article, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Stuart is a professor emeritus of management at Cornell University's Johnson Graduate School of Management, where he founded the Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise. Capitalism at the Crossroads, published in 2005, was selected by Cambridge University as one of the top 50 books on sustainability of all time. The third edition of the book was published in 2010. In this year, 2022, he will publish a new book, The Next Capitalist Reformation. Welcome, Stuart Hart. Pleasure to be here, Kai. Well, Stuart, uh, we met in North Carolina in about 15, 20 years ago, and you talked about the company Nirma in India, and it was a pioneer story with connection to the multinational company Unilever, a story that explored the markets at the bottom of the pyramid and what has happened since then. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think in, in many ways that story is kind of emblematic of the journey in a lot of ways because the, uh, you know, so C.K. Prahalad and I, my old colleague C.K. Prahalad, we were both professors at Michigan uh, wrote this piece now 20 years ago called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. And, you know, of course, that was two or three years in the making. So it was really the late 90s was the time frame when, you know, kind of each of us were colliding with thinking in this area, you know, kind of CK more in, a, in emerging markets. Mine was sort of more an evolving way of thinking about what was a new term, sustainable business. And it was very clear that sustainable business couldn't just mean green. It also had to mean lifting the underserved in a green way, uh, or, or else the whole the whole dream of a sustainable world was really just was that a dream? So my thinking increasingly turned toward how, how do we how do we imagine developing you know commercially developing the underserved, and that's where the term the kind of the bottom of the pyramid first emerged you know in Pro, Pro, and I wrote that piece. And I think one of the compelling stories, there were several actually, uh, one of them was the Hindustan Lever Nirma story, which I think was what, what really sort of drew uh, what was then Hindustan Lever, now Hindustan Unilever, drew them into this space in a very aggressive way. But there were others, like, for example, the Semex story, the Mexican cement company Semex. Uh, and their development of a business called Patrimonio Oi was happening at the same time in the late 90s. And these were, you know, some of, some of the kind of pioneers, at least as far as large corporations were concerned. And I think that's where the Nirma story begins, because, of course, Nirma was a local Indian company. It was not a multinational. It was a local Indian company. And Nirma had developed a very low-cost way of providing deter detergents, soaps and detergents to the underserved. Uh, and their formulation was very low cost. It was also somewhat caustic, but it was very low cost. And they were, then, they were also able then to develop a business model of selling it without packaging. They would go, it was old school, right? They would go door to door and basically real, refill people's containers at home. And that was their business model. And they were able to, to deliver that at a, at a very, very affordable price. And that began, as, as that business began to take off, it began to eat into what was then Hindustan Lever, now Hindustan Unilever's uh, kind of flagship brand of detergents, uh, because it was good enough. It was classic Clayton Christensen disruption, right? Starting from the bottom and moving up, it began to migrate up market and began to cut into some of Hindustan Lever's soap and detergent business. And it began to get their attention as a result. Uh, and so they, they resolved 
to uh, focus on the underserved space, which they really hadn't done before, right? And not in a significant way. That led, the that led to the development of a new product called Wheel, which was explicitly their, you know, their cleaning, their, their detergent product for the underserved, you know, for the quote, bottom of the pyramid. Although, you know, realistically, the bottom of the pyramid isn't actually the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> the, the, the bottom of the pyramid is sort of the uh, lower part of the income pyramid, right? It's still the portion of the income pyramid where people can, can actually function in the money economy. Uh, so it's not the very, very bottom of the pyramid. But the wheel story is interesting because it, it, they, they came up with a new formulation once again, like NIRMA. Uh, and they also came up with a novel way, you know, of in their case, you know, uh, NIRMA was no packaging. Wheel was innovative packaging, which was sachet packaging. And, you know, if you look at it, if you just stop full stop for a moment, you realize, and it was clear even then, right, that from an environmental point of view, that wasn't going to work long term. <laughs> you know, it was going to create a, you know, a massive micro packaging waste problem. Uh, but, you know, I mean, being a multinational, they were very concerned with, with, product adulteration and so forth. So they wanted it to be packaged in a way that would preserve its quality, be safe and so forth. Nirma was a door-to-door -door company. They were a local company, an Indian company, had fewer concerns that way. Uh, but, you know, as you might expect, as that ramped up and it, and it did, they, those, were, those became pitched competitors. They were, they were similarly priced and it led to a very healthy competition. It also, you know, kind of convinced Hindustan uh, lever that there was a business opportunity in the lower income space. So they began to invest in it more and that ultimately led to the development of their entirely new distribution model called the Shakti entrepreneur model where they would work with mostly women in, in villages and train them as essentially sales agents and promoters to sell Hindustan lever products starting with wheel but then eventually you know, including a number of other products. You know, we needed to think more about not, not just selling stuff to poor people, but rather imagining kind of co-creating products with those that are underserved, such that it serves sort of real needs and wants of the underserved, not projections of what we think they want or need, or what we've already got that we can sell them. <laughs> and, and so that led to a whole uh, body of work around co-creating with the base of the pyramid, that I was closely involved in with a number of colleagues, uh, you know, sort of B BOP, base of the pyramid 2.0, as it's known, which is really more of a co-creation methodology. Uh, and of course, for, uh, for Unilever and Hindustan Unilever, that they, they began to kind of internalize a lot of those learnings and it came to inform, because their Shakti entre entrepreneur approach initially didn't really work very well because it was product push. But as they got better at these things with experience, you know, over time, they've come to evolve a set of products that are what we would think of as more co-creative. Um, and, you know, and today, the Shakti Entrepreneur uh, business model and business for Hindustan Unilever is a very significant portion of their business. Can you give the listener a little bit of a description of what you mean by the bottom of the pyramid? Sure. Yeah. When you know, so I'll, I'll harken back to when CK and I first, you know, first began working on that piece. It it stemmed from kind of a focus on large corporations. Right. That that was really the origin story. That large corporations, typically in the you know mid '90s didn't really think about poverty as an issue that was of any significance to them. That was for governments and NGOs and philanthropists. You know, it was like a, a division of labor. Large corporations sold things to rich people or people you know, with, a, with a expendable funds, as it were, or discretionary funds. Uh, and that, that was really how they conceived of themselves in a, in a you know, they, they would then engage in philanthropy, right? But they didn't see kind of the issue of poverty and the underserved as part of their commercial model. 
so we were, CK and I were, our original kind of motivation for writing the piece was to, to be provocative, you know, to sort of call into question that conventional wisdom that large corporations, you know, were not, it didn't exist to serve the underserved, you know, and so we, and that was really the core message of the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, that in fact, there, there are, there, there were and there are significant opportunities to serve the underserved in a, in a commercially viable way. Uh, and that corporations ought to pay more attention to it because in point of fact, the top of the pyramid is not growing. <laughs> you know, that the business at the very, the top of the pyramid is, is stagnant, right? So corporations had for some period of time been focused on quote, emerging markets, which were the rising kind of either the, the, the emerging the middle class and the and the you know emerging wealthy around the world and you know in in so-called developing countries, uh, you know large global companies have been looking to open those markets for twenty years, right? Starting in the in the mm. late seventies and eighties, and again that that wasn't really taking off to the extent that 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 wasn't providing the growth engine necessarily, right? That there weren't even after the fall of communism, there weren't you know hundreds of millions of, of rising middle-class people clamoring for multinational corporate products. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't coming off the way they had hoped. So there was added logic for thinking that it, it was necessary to think in a new way, right? And CK and Ken Lieberthal wrote a piece at about the same time. And actually this is how CK and I kind of struck our collaboration. They wrote a piece that appeared in Harvard Business Review around 1997 or eight called The End of Corporate Imperialism. And it was about the failure of, of emerging market strategies, in, primarily in China and India, and how it was necessary to think in, in, in to think, you know, sort of in innovative terms in, in terms of strategy, not just downselling existing products through existing business models. But then, you know, I, I, had, I had written this piece that was in Harvard Business Review in 1997 called Beyond Greening, Strategies for a Sustainable World. Um, where, you know, I also made the argument that just kind of incremental greening strategies of pollution prevention and eco-efficiency among the rich countries in the West was not going to get us where we needed to go, that we needed to think create much more creatively about how we brought the sustainable development agenda to the corporate world. And that was really what kind of started the conversation between CK and I that led to the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And it was, and, and again, it was driven by, you know, a sense that large corporations could, should, must invest energy in, think, in, in strategy innovation and thinking about new strategies and business models that were capable of serving and lifting the underserved at the base of the pyramid. Now, many of the initial forays into that space by, by large corporations, and there were many, right, that it did strike a nerve and it prompted a lot, a lot of kind of investment and business activity and initiatives most of them in the early going were what we've called base of the pyramid 1.0, which is basically taking product that you already have, you know, and uh, putting it in smaller packages, you know, is the sachet mentality. So that you can sell it at a lower price point, even though it's more by volume, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, kind of look, looking to, to market it in unique ways, maybe having uh, NGO partners as distributors or what have you. So the business model innovation was in distribution more than anything else, and, and having that stand as the base of the pyramid strategy. That was not a terribly successful approach, right? The, what, what we've since labeled BOP 1.0. Uh, and, you know, Ted London and I and other colleagues, Eric Simonis, you know, I did a, did a bunch of work around what we call base of the pyramid 2.0, which starts with a recognition that just, just trying to project unmet needs from the outside in using you know, UN data and you know, World Bank data and so forth on what the unmet needs of the poor were uh, does not an effective strategy make. Uh, rather, it requires much more intimate knowledge and understanding of getting on the ground uh, and then actually co-developing, co-developing the functionality that's needed, which would be the, you know, kind of what, the, what a product artifact or service artifact might be but then developing a business model that's much more inclusive at the same time that truly does serve and lift the recipient community, not just selling things into the community, 
but serving and lifting, which could also include sourcing from. Uh, and I think that that was an important insight and an important lesson. And, you know, and I, and I think it, it shows out well, because if you look at the last 10, 15 years of where the most progress has been made when it comes to business and poverty, it's mostly been in sustainable sourcing. Right, that that's where we've seen lot, lots of energy. It's it's purchase. It's buying from the poor, not selling to the poor. Uh, that is what puts money right in the underserved uh, community pocket. But increasingly now, I think we coming we see that coming f full circle again, where sustainable sourcing doesn't just mean sourcing commodity products from from you know smallholder farmers. It means devising strategies that include collaboration to lift entire underserved communities. And that necessarily means bringing new product into them as well. Yeah. So, I, so I think, you know, we've come a long way in the last 20 years when it comes to thinking about this. And of course, it, ex it extends uh, appropriately far beyond large multinational corporations, right? That, that might have been the initial provocation that Prahalad and I put in place, but it was never intended to be limited to that. And of course, fairly quickly, that kind of thinking spread to you know local companies small and medium sized enterprises new ventures you know sort of uh inclusive business uh social entrepreneurship and so forth so it, it became a, a larger movement of com commercial activity for the underserved writ large well uh when we go behind this a little bit before you come to the the concept of business model and uh, it was something that drive you uh, into this area what is the story behind that you come to the conclusion to would like to drive this type of development my backstory is you know i'm I'm a like increasingly old, you know, old boomer environmentalist, right? I mean, you know, I came out of the '70s, uh, came out of graduated from college in 1974, uh, was very much an environmentalist at that stage of the game. Went right on, did my master's degree at what was then the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Was convinced corporations were the enemy, and they probably were. <laughs> uh, worked in the NGO world for a period of time, but then, you know, as time wore on, it became increasingly clear to me that that just trying to stop bad projects, which is the main agenda, right, I would say in the 70s, wasn't really terribly inspiring, you know, sort of using legal means, you know, in the U.S. there was this new tool called environmental impact statements, which, you know, deft NGOs could use to stall, could drag out, delay, and ultimately kind of get projects canceled. That they viewed as destructive and you know i was involved in a bunch of that but after a few years of it you know i said this isn't really going to float my boat long term uh, and i began working with people who you know sort of had a different lens of looking at it right that and one guy in particular an old uh, colleague of mine a guy named gordon inc uh worked at this uh, think tank which was anachronistically called the institute on man and science <laughs> uh, but you know he was a phd and you know, thought more analytically, not just sort of an advocate, and actually worked with corporations, right? Did his, did his PhD on the forest products industry and innovations around sustainable forestry. And the more that I kind of got to know him, kind of thought it through, talked about it, the more it became clear that it was interesting to understand why would organize, not just corporations, but agencies too, why would they propose and undertake such seemingly destructive and stupid projects in the first place? So that, that got me interested in decision-making and strategy. And I ultimately went back and I did my PhD at the University of Michigan in strategy. Um, and that was kind of how I fell into this, right? That it was in the mid eighties, there was a hot job market in business schools because business schools were taking a lot of abuse for being you know, sort of non-scholarly. You know, <laughs> there are these bastions of you know, just sort of like teaching shops of retired consultants and accountants and executives but they didn't really have a research agenda, which was true, right? I, I mean, I did my PhD in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, wasn't in the business school, right? Because business schools really were not seen as a place you would do research back then, even though it was in strategy, it was more interdepartmental. And I was involved with the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan, which is very well known. Uh, you know, one of, one of the 
motherships of participatory management. Right? It was the Institute for Social Research. Uh, but you know, by the mid to late 80s, so now business schools were hiring PhD trained people. So there was a huge market for people that are PhD trained. So I went out, I, you know, I threw my hat in the ring, had all these job offers, including one at the Business School of Michigan, and I decided to stay. So I started teach. I got I was a rookie in 1986 as an assistant professor, and it was immediately thrown in the classroom in corporate to teach the core course in corporate strategy. That was what it was called back then, you know, because that was sort of the still kind of the conglomeration era, you know. It, we're, you know, we're in the midst now. I see in retrospect during the 80s of you know kind of financial capitalism and neoliberalism and shareholder primacy taking business schools over. That was what was happening. But most corporations were still conglomerate, you know, di highly diversified. So corporate strategy was still the term of art, right? Whereas within uh, within ten years, the you know the the takeover artists that broke up all the conglomerates had been successful, so, such that it was no longer corporate strategy. You know, then by the by the '90s, strategy course was called just strategy or business strategy. But back then, it was corporate strategy. I got thrown in the classroom, and I had no idea what I was doing. You know, got slaughtered by the students in terms of course evaluations. And then they threw, they uh, it was like another rookie and a guy who had been there two years. That, those were the three professors teaching the core course in corporate strategy at Michigan. Uh, and since it did so poorly, they couldn't let that continue. So they brought the, you know, they brought the ace in to become the course head. You know, to because there's six sections right in the MBA program. Uh, each professor teaching two. So they brought the ace professor teacher in. To straighten this out, and that was none other than C.K. Prahala. That's how I got to know him, and you know, he also taught me how to teach. Right? I had no idea what I was doing. But after a few years of teaching that course, you know, trying to bring new content in, trying to bring kind of environment, because back then it was called environmental management, right? That it was before sustainability was a term in business, because the you know Brundtland Commission was only what like 1987, right? So. It still hadn't crept into business school yet. It was still like called business and environment, you know, was the was the term then. Kept trying to bring it in, like into the core course, and kept being rebuked, you know, like, you know, like as an assistant professor, maybe you should just like keep your nose clean, go back to your office, write journal articles, forget about this because it's going to destroy your career. <laughs> and uh, and I still remember, I, it was it was in 1990 that I we had a new dean in the business school. And a new dean in the School of Natural Resources and Environment, as it was called then. Now it's the School of Environment and Sustainability. <laughs> Back then it was the School of Natural Resources and Environment. But we had new deans both in the business school and in the environment school who sort of hit it off with each other and were open to collaboration. And that's what allowed me to kind of jump through that window. In 1990, uh, you know, I, I became the founding director of the dual degree program at Michigan that's now called the Herb Institute Dual Masters. Back then it was called the Corporate Environmental Management Program. And you know, about the only faculty member who was, other than the deans, because they were happy to have me take that risk, right? But almost everyone else said this, you are out of your mind because this is gonna ruin your career. About the only person who said it wouldn't was Prahla, you know, who said like, like look, you know, you've got this weird background, uh, you know, like the Yale School for Forestry and Environment, like, if you don't pursue what you're really passionate about, you don't get paid enough as an academic to, you know, to teach and do research on a bunch of stuff that you don't have any interest in. You know, if you don't, you'll look back in 20 years and you'll never forgive yourself if you don't do this. So, uh, so I did. I, I made the decision in 1990. I still remember a very conscious choice that I was going to devote the rest of my professional life to that. Come hell or high water, I didn't really care what happened. And eventually, I got turned down for tenure there, but that that was okay, you know. <laughs> It must be that you, you, you had a sort of a, a thread of uh, entrepreneurship in your mindset. Yeah, wasn't it? yeah. So I just began to turn my attention to that. And because the, the two deans had agreed to create this dual degree program, it gave me a vehicle, right? I became the founding director of this dual degree program. And, uh, and all of my focus, so I'd like I developed two new classes. One was called Strategies for Environmental Management. The other was Strategies for Sustainable Development. It was the first course by that name that I'm aware of. At least in Michigan, anyway. 
uh, and uh, and then I began writing about it. Right, so I wrote some early some early pieces that began to put me on the map. I wrote this academic piece that was published in '95 called "The Natural Resource Based View of the Firm," and you know the and the early rationale for bringing this content into business schools was eco efficiency. Right, it was it was the it was Rio. Right, it was. Uh, the world founding of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and Stefan schmidt heine And the whole thing was about eco-efficiency, that we can eliminate waste, reduce waste, you know, reduce emissions, and that reduce cost and risk, drops to the bottom line, right? So there was there was a clear business justification, short-term, you know, kind of something that that fit within the market fundamentalist shareholder primacy way of thinking that had taken over. But that was really the logic, right? That's what allowed this to creep into business schools. In the early '90s, and you, and you had support of especially the chemical chemical industry players then that were getting slammed and had adopted this, the Dow's and 3M's and Duponts and so forth. They were all supporters of our program. Uh, and you know, but as I the more I I did research on it, learned about companies, learned about this space, thought about it, the more evident it was to me that that wasn't going to be nearly sufficient. Right, that eco efficient eco efficiency in operations. Even product stewardship, sort of thinking about how do we better design, think about life cycle impacts. You know, there were people thinking about those things back then, 30 years ago. Uh, not much, but there were <laughs> right there was there was some thinking about that. At least as far as product take back is concerned, there was a, in Europe that was happening, right? Like BMW and so forth. Uh, but even that, so pollution prevention and product stewardship, which were two distinct strategies. You know, I've written paper this natural resource based view of the firm, develop those as competitive strategies. Uh, but, but even that was really about just sort of tweaking current products. You know, it seemed to me that, and what I ev eventually developed was, was this model called the sustainable value framework, uh, where, you know, most, you know, most conventional capitalists that even adopt balanced scorecard thinking would say, even in an age of short-termism and shareholder primacy, yeah, you need to perform, you know, short term, you know, you need to deliver a result, you need to have a bottom line, you know, deliver results uh, in today's markets. But you also have to be competing for the future at the same time, right? You have to be developing new competency, skills, technologies, capabilities, new products, opening up new markets, or else eventually you're going to fly the plane into the ground. And so the more I thought about it, I developed the sustainable value framework, the bottom part of it, which is around today's business, you know, uh, running it internally more efficiently, which is eco-efficiency and pollution prevention, and running it externally more effectively was around stakeholder engagement and product stewardship. That's great. That was pretty well developed. But the upper part of the matrix, which is about tomorrow, is kind of blank, you know, and that so I came to fill that in with strategies around what I called clean technology, which is innovating entirely new leapfrog technologies that would make the current more e eco-efficient but inherently unsustainable way of doing things obsolete. Uh, and then the, the external part of it was, uh, you know, underserved, unserved markets, right? Tomorrow's markets. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was in the 95 paper and then the Harvard Business Review piece, the Beyond Greening piece, brought that to life in a very significant way. The title of which was Beyond Greening, Strategies for a Sustainable World. So it focused on the upper part of that matrix, and it was primitive by today's standards, but that was the message of the article, right? So I was already by 97, it was pretty clear in my mind, 96, 97, that unless we figured out a way to engage the business sector, the enterprise sector, you know, the kind of the capitalist <laughs> in all of us, in, in the project of raising the base of the income pyramid, dealing with global inequality. That we had that we just there was just no way, right? That this was never going to be an effective approach just to green up the rich people in the US and Europe and Japan. It wasn't going to work. But it must be uh, a lot of challenges in, in, in this time. And, and even as an <laughs> entrepreneur, you, you're going into new areas of trying to change things uh, what was the biggest challenge you remember from this time to there were sort of probably twin challenges one you know is is academically i was seen as kind of this topic hopper dilettante you know who was originally doing work on strategic decision making 
and then had jumped to this kind of crazy topic. And so I was denied tenure. Uh, that's what took me to the University of North Carolina, right? I kind of stuck around for a couple of years off the tenure track at Michigan, continued to build up the dual degree program, but continued to write, right? And the interesting thing was that there, this work did get published, right? I mean, it, it did get published. I was probably lucky in that regard, like the, the Harvard Business Review piece, I was lucky because I had people kind of in my court who introduced me to editors there and so forth. But they did publish it, right? And and that's really what what launched things was that our, that article won the McKinsey Award that year in 1997. Is to my knowledge, it was the first article in Harvard Business Review on the topic of business and sustainability. There had been some pieces in there about recycling and that sort of thing before, but never a piece on kind of strategy and sustainability, especially about the developing world. I, it was the first piece, to my knowledge. Uh, and that kind of put me on the map, right? So I began getting contacts from more and more companies. And, you know, having, having kind of the experience of working with CK, who always was someone focused on practice, whereas the academic world at the time was going increasingly away from that, that it was just about academic journal publishing. And if you work with companies, you, you became soiled. I just didn't care about that, right? And it's part of the reason I was turned down for tenure. But as, as, it, as it works, you know, if you, if you actually write things and do things that have impact, other schools mysteriously get interested in you. <laughs> so, oh. so I began, other, other places began approaching me and I had a tenured offer from UNC and I went. Yeah. And so that's, started, a, that, that's a, the advice for the young generation who are studying today. Totally, how, totally. How to, I, I mean, I think it's entirely consistent with the you know, what you often hear, you know, from people in retrospect, like me now saying it. But at the time, there was no certainty that if I did that, it would ever, you know, ever work, right? That it would ever, I, I just decided I was going to do it. And I, I didn't really care what the consequences were. I figured I'd be able to make a living somehow, right? I, but, you know, as it turned out, you know, I sort of landed on my feet. And that if you do something that's, that's worthwhile and notable, uh, you know, more often than not, it's recognized at least by some, right? And at least enough or the right people who can open up another door for you, which is what happened in my case, right? So I went and was, you know, hired with tenure at the at Keenan Flagler at the business school at UNC, started a center there. And then, you know, Cornell came after me, right? Where I had Sam Johnson of SE Johnson, you know, it was the Johnson School of Management and Sam gave an endowment gift to start a center and they recruited me for that. So, you know, and by then, you know, I had done a whole bunch more. Then we'd had the, the bottom of the pyramid stuff. We had started the base of the pyramid global network. There had been several other published pieces that had come out. So, you know, I had become a little bit more of, a stab, of an established entity. when I went to Cornell in 2003 uh, and then, then, you know, wrote Capitalism at the Crossroads, which came out in five. If we move a little bit in the front of uh, the years now and, and coming into today's discussion and, and when you look at uh, the dialogue around system thinking, governance, circular economy, often, it, often in combination with leadership, how, how do you see this discussion related to the bottom of the pyramid? I mean, I see these topics kind of importantly merging, right? That the idea of the bottom of the pyramid or the base of the pyramid I see really is just being, it's, it's absorbed into the lens of thinking today in the form of inclusive business. Uh, increasingly, while its origin was more, more within the four walls of the company, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? DEI, which is kind of the term of art these days, while it started as more of an issue for, you know, sort of internal hiring and HR, uh, Increasingly, companies are realizing that it applies across the entire value chain. And so it merges with the idea of serving the underserved and base of the pyramid. Uh, so, I, you know, I, so I see the, I, what, was, what was then sort of a distinct idea of strategies for the bottom of the pyramid, I think have, and because of all the variants that have come as well, like social, you know, social entrepreneurship, uh, uh, b business and poverty, hybrid value chains, you know, there are, lo there are lots of 
shared value, right? Which I think emerged really that because that that's a much later evolution, right? The idea of shared value. Uh, they they all are around the same idea, right? They're they're around the same idea. So I and I think the most important next level evolution of what's happening now is is the idea that because uh, because capitalists and the world of enterprise spent too much time talking about the idea of transformation and sustainability, but mostly just doing greening, right? Doing o mainly just incremental reduction, what Bill McDonough used to call being less bad, right? Reducing negative impact, not really investing in tomorrow's technologies or tomorrow's markets because they were being held to account by short-term short investment, by the logic of shareholder primacy. Uh, they talked a good game, but really didn't make those kind of signal investments that would enable the kind of transformation that we need to occur. So here we are 20 years later, and, and it's now a crisis, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're now at a point where even if companies were to, were to actually practice something like was something like what I preached 20 some years ago in the Beyond, Beyond Greening piece, even if companies were to, to devote themselves individually the strategy for you know leapfrogging to inherently green technology and 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 incubating it in the underserved space like like disruptors right applying the Christensen disruptive innovation way of thinking to leapfrog clean technology even if they were to do that it wouldn't be enough uh, to address you know the, the the level of crisis that we face so I think the biggest evolution that's occurred the biggest realization that's occurred over the last few years is the recognition when you talk about systems thinking that, that business people and especially corporate leaders, but all business people need to be thinking in terms of system change and system redesign, not just their own competitive corporate and competitive strategies and corporate competencies. They have to become active participants in the game of redesigning the institutions of capitalism and, you know, and the support systems underneath it and, and transforming the very, the, the financial structure in particular, the financial system uh, entirely, because it's, it's the larger system context that, that holds back the kind of transformative change that we need. That, so increasingly you see the work like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development's 2050 work is focused around that. If you see Paul Pullman and Andrew Winston's new book on net positive, that's a central part of the message. You know, I think Unilever came to that recognition under Pullman, uh, you know, some time ago, right, that, that that's really what it was going to take is becoming involved in what I call not just business aspirations, but corporate quests. You actually have to, you, as a corporate leader, you have to be on a quest to change entire systems. Uh, and sometimes at a world scale, and you can't do that by yourself, it, it can only be done by uh, catalyzing and leading, you know, more systemic partnerships and change ecosystems. Over the last five years, I've, I'm no historian by training, but I, I think I've come to develop a pretty healthy understanding of, you know, the term capitalism only dates, only dates back to the mid 19th century as a term, but the commission of what we think of as capitalism today has been going on in the world for 400, four to 500 years, right? Starting in the era of mercantilism with the trading companies, those were capitalist enterprises, whether they were called capitalist or not. Uh, so I've gone back and tried to tried to sort of trace the evolution of that kind of capitalist behavior, and you know, sort of come to the conclusion that there, you know, well, it's sort of obvious that this is not the the current sort of strife, you know, and kind of challenge that we're living through, of you know, we'll call it the sustainability revolution, is not the first go round, right? It's not the first time capitalism has run amok in the world. Capitalism has run amok in the world before, two times before, by my estimation. Uh, you know, and, and the first time was, was the age of mercantilism. Uh, and then, then, then there were a set of countervailing actions and, and rebellions and reforms and, and transformations that, that really reined in and restrained that behavior. I mean, the death of the trading companies, the death of, mercantil of, of at least English and Dutch and so forth style mercantilism, 
Uh, and the American Revolution, in many ways, was the defining death knell of that form of capitalism. You know, the American Revolution was a revolution against monopoly capitalism. That, that's really what it was. And, and corporate corporations were reined in for the better part of a half century, right, until railroads and the industrialists emerged, right, in the, in the mid to late 19th century, when capitalism run, ran amok again, right, only to be reined in again, you know, by the progressives, and then ultimately by the Keynesians, you know, and, and FDR and so forth in America, which produced another period, you know, in the post-war years of known as sort of the golden age of capitalism, although it had its significant warts to be sure, and blind spots. But, you know, that, that period, especially in the US, but it's, I think it's true throughout the developed world, uh, that period in the post-war years, the 50s and 60s, and even a bit into the 70s, uh, was a time when, you know, it was, the, it was the most equitable time that the developed capitalist world had ever achieved. Right. Now, the, the year I graduated from high school, which was 1970, the U.S. was the most equal it's ever been, you know, if you look at it in terms of the Gini index. <laughs> and, and it was the result of the way capitalism was committed during the post-war years. Now, there were a lot of blind spots like environment, women, race. I mean, there are plenty of blind spots, most of which, you know, people my age and your age spent time rebelling against in the 60s. But, but at the very least, you know, kind of the institutions of capitalism saw themselves as institutions, saw themselves as part of the fabric of society. And they behaved in the opposite manner. It was managerial primacy and customer primacy and community primacy, not shareholder primacy. It was the opposite. So, I, you know, in the book, I try to harvest the lessons from history about how in the past capitalism had been had been reformed, restrained, brought back, because I believe we're in another one of those periods now. And there are lessons to be learned. So I try to, I try to bring them out in the book, but then suggest that the challenges, the predicament we're in now, there are elements that are unique that we've never faced before, like never before has capitalism threatened the life support system of the planet. That's, that's never happened before. Right? So, you know, we, we have some unique challenges that we face now, but you know, uh, concentration, monopoly, toxic inequality, you know, pollution. I mean, th these are all things that we faced before and had to and had to, and have figured out ways to redress them. So I, I have some re reasonable faith that we will do so again, right? And so part of it is just kind of learning from history, but then part of it is realizing the size and scope and, ch and dimension, the dimension of the challenge we face, which means that business leaders you know, cannot flinch at this point, uh, which is why the system transformation piece of it is so important. Part of it is you know, sort of embedding purpose and made it, making it part of core strategy that, that the, kind of the, the, the agenda of, of creating a sustainable world has to be the business agenda, the commercial agenda. It's no longer a sideshow, it, it, it has to be the main event. Uh, but even beyond that, it's about, be, stepping out, stepping up, and becoming the champions of system redesign. And that means becoming very politically active. We, we see the beginnings of that, but I think we're not even close to what's going to be needed. We, there's certainly some corporate leaders who have become, who have been politically, act, politically active for a long time, but in the wrong ways, right? It's the neoliberals were able to harness a small band of, of, of uh, corporate leaders the Cokes, the Scaifes, the Coors in the U.S., right, that have put massive amounts of money over a long period of time into the neoliberal agenda, which is about minority rule, and it's happening, right? So we know that that approach can work. It's just that we need to flip it on its head, and th those corporate leaders who don't see the world through that lens need to step up to the challenge or it's going to be too late. So you mean that we, we need another type of, of leadership uh, to tackle the problem we have in today's society? Absolutely. We, we, we will, I think we're beginning to see, and we need to see much more, corporate leaders who are not, who are not afraid to speak about those policy and system change issues that need to happen 
in order to pull what they want to do in their companies forward and accelerate it, right? They, right now they're being hamstrung by, by really retrograde policy and systems. The only way that they can accelerate what they're doing by their companies is to change and redesign, to, to be a force in changing and modifying and redesigning mm -hmm. those systems, whether it's the system of subsidies, whether it's the tax system, what, whether it's the financial infrastructure, right? The, the, you know, the, the institutions that support and prop up shareholder primacy must be creatively destroyed. It, that, that, that really is what underpins the last 40 years of financial capitalism. I watched it happen. I watched it. I saw the takeover of business schools in the 80s. I've sat there and watched it happen. It need, we can take it back, right? It's time that we take it back. So for, the, for example, the last eight years, I've been heavily involved in the design, development, launch, and now, now scaling of a completely new MBA program at the University of Vermont. I spent a lot of time in Burlington, Vermont over the last seven or eight years. It's called the Sustainable Innovation MBA program. And we had the rare opportunity because a new dean came there, an old friend and colleague, who you may recall, a guy named Sanjay Sharma, who actually came and joined for, he took a sabbatical and spent half, half a year at UNC with me. And we've written pieces together like a piece called Engaging Fringe Stakeholders for Competitive Imagination and others, right? And Sanjay became the dean of the business school at the University of Vermont 10 years ago. And he had as his personal mission the, you know, the reinvention of business education. His motivation was to go take what was kind of a failing MBA program, small, shrinking, losing money, abolish it, which he did, and then start over again. Uh, and, that's, and then he got me involved in that starting around 20, 2013 or so. And we've been able over that period of time to start with a clean sheet of paper, develop a completely new MBA program from scratch, that we think represents a model for what business education needs to look like for the 21st century, which is, which is uh, explicitly not based in shareholder primacy or market fundamentalism. It's not the old, you know, I spent like 20 some years in top 20 business schools just developing centers and elective sequences, all of which happened in the second year. So the students had already been brainwashed by the core, which was rooted in shareholder primacy. So by the, by the time you get them, they'd already been basically programmed uh, and it's too late. Our new MBA program from start to finish is focused, we're a purpose-driven MBA. Uh, you know, we're, we're also accredited by AACSB, but that doesn't mean that you just teach the gospel of you know, shareholder primacy-driven finance. So, they have to understand, you know, students have to understand that world, but they have to understand it from a critical perspective. Mm -hmm. Warts and all, what's wrong with it? What are the toxic side effects of employing it? What other thinking needs to be brought in to, to supplement, complement, maybe even supplant that way of thinking? That's what our MBA program is focused on. We are now talking a lot of uh, business leaders. Will this also depend on the political side of society? Do we need, that's, that's, see, absolutely. That's need what I'm to saying. see that, another uh, sort of those political leaders, leadership relationship? Those, bus those bus business leaders need to become outspoken about the political, about the policy side. of. Unless we have kind of forward-leaning policy innovation, we're doomed. And the, you know, the, the retrograde attempts to wrest you know, control of countries by a minority, which is what's happening in the US right now and in places in Europe. I mean, it's an authoritarian move. Unless we're able to turn that back, I'm really fearful for the future. So when can we read your new book? Uh, well, I mean, I'm pretty far along with it. And my, my hope is that it'll be out in 2022. Um, you know, part one is sort of the history piece, including a history rhymes chapter, and but then the unique kind of uh, predicament we face called the great race. Uh, and then the second part of the book is on corporate transformations. That's about embedding purpose and redesigning the corporate architecture. And then the third part of the book is about system redesigns. And I focus specifically on, on the, the necessity of creatively destroying the MBA industry which I believe is one of the root causes of our problem. The American style MBA is a root cause of our problem. 
so part of it, there's one chapter devoted to the uh, to the reinvention of business education. Uh, and the this sustainable innovation MBA program is the living case. I have living cases for the corporate chapters too with companies I'm working with. This chapter is called Redefining the Meaning of Value, which you know, where the living case is the long-term stock market. Uh, that we we need to creatively destroy the public equities markets because they just are focused on the wrong things. My, my last question for you is sustainability sustainable? Uh, well, I mean, I, there, there's this, there's the, there's the su sustainability as a term, and then there's the sustainability as an idea. Uh, and, and it might be that the, the word, the term sustainability perhaps has outlived its usefulness. That's entirely possible. But, but I don't think that changes in any way the underlying challenges that we've been talking about and elaborating on now for some time. So I think like, like everything else, ter terminology evolves and it might be that sustainability is a dated term that you know, had its place you know, in the 90s and 2000s and so forth and is now you know, perhaps outlived its usefulness. Maybe it doesn't really communicate what we need you know, and we're moving on to resilience and, re and regeneration and blah, 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 right? The circularity. But, you know, so, so much in those terms is a rehash, you know, of older terms, you know, whether it's closed loop or what, you know. So, I, you know, I think the terms can come and go. What's important is the concept. To me, the big difference be between circularity and closed loop is the closed loop really was firm level. Circularity really is industry and society, society level. And I think we, we need to keep kind of our, our units of analysis straight. So I don't think it's possible to have a circular company. I think it's possible to have a circular industry or a circular society, not a circular company. You know, you can you can aim to try to close the loop in a company, but you're never going to be entirely successful, right? That it, there's going to always be leakage, but it's, you know, it's possible through thinking in terms of industrial ecology that you, another term, right, that is an old term, but in some ways, the old thinking about industrial ecology is crucial to circularity. So I think, you know, the terms kind of come and go. What's important, I think, is the underlying concepts. Thank you very much, Stuart, for the talk today. My pleasure. I'm Kai Embren. Follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn, where I will be announcing the future guests to this podcast. And you can expect about two programs a month. And each guest has a unique story of making business and society sustainable. So find out more. Visit my homepage, kaiembren.org. Thank you for listening. <laughs>